number three or four um, things then is done. Well, should those of stuff, I'm not going to explain much of it just in case it's ordering his intro. Um, so, give us some quiet, especially over the sides, please. Side conversations if you want to go out the back, please. Otherwise, it's such a silence thing. Um, and I think that's an acceptable level of hubbub. And so, I'll hand it over to you, Lars. Thank you. So, hello everyone. As Matt said, I gave it to him like, I think it was like last time I gave it to him in London Met Devils, it was about like five years ago, and I was giving a talk about Rocket. Does anyone remember Rocket by CoreOS? Oh, uh, whatever happened to that. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, yeah, let's not open that kind of terms. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about WebAssembly. Um, how many of you here are developers? Oh, great, so we're like half and half, so okay. Cool, so um, first, a little bit about me. So I just realized that the font is kind of like grayish. So can anybody read that, or is that okay? Is it good? It's, kind of, it's good on video, so that's fine. Um, so a little bit about me. So I, um, people call me tech hipster because generally if you, if you follow me on Twitter, or like follow me somewhere, on the cyber, in the cyberspace, you will find me like uh, tinkering around with like cutting edge technologies. That's how, you know, one of the so the tech hipster uh, is a name I was given. I was given by um, current head of security of Docker, Justin Cormack. Some of you might know him. He was like, "Oh, you're such a tech hipster." That's coming from a guy who was trying to convert me into using unicorns. Does anybody know what unicorn is? Fantastic. We have two people. Okay, one person. That's just Mark. Thank you, Mark. So. Um, <laughs> So I work for a company called Micro. Um, we're like a tiny little startup, it's just basically two of us uh, right now. We're not hiring, but maybe we are. It depends how good you are from a hacker. So uh, it's basically just two of us. If you want to talk about like what we're doing, come and talk to me. I probably won't be able to explain it to you because it's probably even complex for us at this moment. At, this, uh, at the moment, so you can follow me on Twitter. There's a GitHub profile. I also occasionally blog on the cybernetics.com thing, and I started Kubernetes London meetup, so um, some of you may have been, may have attended one of these meetups, she definitely has, uh, she was there actually a couple days ago, uh, right on the day when Cloudflare experienced this massive outage, we had a meetup at their offices. Uh, but anyways, so so that's uh, about me, you can follow me on Twitter. So let's, this is the agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about history of the web. We're going to talk about what is WebAssembly, why should we care, should we care at all? I don't know, maybe we should. I personally believe we totally should. But uh, let's see if I can uh, convince you about that. And then at the end of the talk, we're just going to speculate about the future. Uh, there's going to be lots of speculations. So, um, JavaScript. Do we have any JavaScript developers? Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, it, it, like, I mean, web is running in JavaScript. Um, this is me making this call, but I just like, attribute it to anyone. This is like us sitting in a, sitting in a pub like, a couple of years ago, and uh, every, I guess everybody's familiar with the call by Peter Thiel, and they promised they promise us jetpacks and all we got was on Twitter and whatnot. Um, so all we got on the web is JavaScript, and then we're just like keep coming up with new frameworks. <laughs> And then it seems to be like there's no end to it. We're sort of like each framework brings something on its own, and everybody claims this is much faster than the other thing, this is much faster than the other thing, and you're like, okay, fair enough. But if you look at it, we're, we're making like very, very small and incremental changes. So what we want is actually we want a step change in speed and in delivering the web apps. So let's have a look at about history of the web. Um, so in 1995, um, there's this guy called Mark, Mark Andreessen uh, who started a company called uh, Netscape, and this was uh, pretty much the uh, ascent of the web, like uh, as we know it. And the guys in Netscape, they were they were developing a uh, web browser, and they realized that people building the web apps, they needed some kind of like programming language which would make the web more dynamic and glue everything sort of together. So they realized, that, okay, what are we going to do? So they approached a company called Sun Microsystems, may they rest in peace. 
Um, <laughs> and they, they were sort of like contemplating, oh, maybe we should put Java on our browser. Uh, eventually, they decided to, go, to hire a guy called Brandon Pike. Uh, Brandon Pike is like this crazy hacker. He's running a new company right now. Um, he, uh, he was tasked with writing a new programming language. So, over the scope of like 10 days, I think, or like maybe it was like, maybe not even 10 days, maybe it was something just over a week, he hacked up this thing called LiveScript. Um, and they were like, oh, this is really cool, we don't have to talk to, uh, to, to Sun about this because, you know, licensing and this and that. So they, they put LiveScript into Netscape. And this was basically pretty much like when the JavaScript was born. This was in 1995. They, they called it JavaScript, they renamed the LiveScript into JavaScript, and there's lots of like, you know, speculation about, oh, are they trolling Sun or whatever, or is it going to be easier for developers to adopt? I don't know, I guess we'll never know. Um, so, when JavaScript was invented in 1995, everybody started adopting it, and it was sort of like plateaus, and then, and then Google happened. And the whole like, web started like, picking up more adoption, Google started floating uh, on the stock market, everybody wanted to get on the web because it was like a big thing, and uh, Google decided like, hmm, look at this, we're paying, we're paying this, all this money to Firefox for having this like, tiny little search thing in, a, in a Firefox, why don't we just like, create our own browser? And then the whole browser wars things happen, and then we finally experience like, oh, wait a second, all the JavaScript is like incredibly slow. A couple of years later, in 2008, um, I'm not sure if it was like a one person's effort or like it's probably a group effort, because uh, because our first JIT compiler, and that was like a big step change for JavaScript. Um, we could what JIT, JIT compiler basically was doing was he was downloading, uh, he was compiling and executing code and optimizing it all in one shot. And then you can see there's, there was a step change in performance of the web. Then, in about 2009, we got Node.js, which basically um, broke the web out of, that was bad word, what I was, what I was gonna say was like, uh, basically like took JavaScript from the browser and placed it on the operating system. So, as we moved on and we just like, you know, this was the first step change, and then we started like optimizing the JITs, started optimizing JIT compilers, and then we sort of like again started plateauing. And now, now we're like entering this phase where okay, maybe, maybe just maybe we can we can speed the web even more. So enter WebAssembly. So this is this is Lynn Clark. Uh, this is a quote by Lynn Clark. This is probably the best quote, uh, or the easiest to digest what WebAssembly is about. It's about a way of running code written in programming languages other than JavaScript on the web. This, this is how it all starts. When she, every time she gives a talk, she always starts to talk like this. By the way, thank you very much for her. This, these are all her, her cartoons. She gave me permission to use them. So um, she, besides like being a great engineer, she also, she also uh, makes uh, code cartoons, uh, which basically like explain like, complicated concepts like in cartoons. So. She's a principal engineer in Mozilla. She was uh, she was there when uh, WebAssembly was invented, and she gave a lot of talks about it. So let's have a look at what JavaScript does and why is it actually slow. So if you look at this, if you look at this picture, um, this is this is what's happening when we're when we're basically executing JavaScript in a browser. So let's just let's just forget the the fetch button. When you when you load the when you load the web page uh, in a browser, you have to download a bunch of libraries. Um, and that was happening there, like they need to be parsed. There's like, you know, lexers happening, and, like, syntactic analysis and whatnot. And then, and then we need to compile it, and then we need to re-optimize it, and all of this is happening on the fly as you're executing your web page. And as you can see, like, surely in this noodle, there is, a, there is a room for improvement. So, turns out there is, and it's called WebAssembly. This is, this is what it looks like in, web, in WebAssembly. So as you can see, we've removed like big parts of that massive noodle, and suddenly everything is like so much more faster. And, uh, and the reason for that is WebAssembly essentially uh, removes the part where, where we sort of like parse, parse the JavaScript code, because the parsing of the JavaScript code um, is the first operation that you do when, you, when you're compiling uh, your code into uh, WebAssembly. So, so that part goes completely away. WebAssembly is sort of like a binary format, we'll get, we'll get to it in, in, later on. Uh, it's a binary format which doesn't need to be parsed anymore because it's compiled into a compact binary form. <coughs> so all we need to do is we need to fetch it and then decode it and then we just like 
uh, then we just execute it. There is a, there is a kind of part of it which says like compile and optimize. It depends on like how how um, browsers sort of like execute execute uh, WebAssembly. But some of some of them just like compile and just run it straight away. Some of them sort of like optimize it. But um, in the grand scheme of things, WebAssembly beats JavaScript by by mile. And the reason for that, we'll get, we'll come back to it. But first, first I'm going to show you like the this is this is how Mozilla sort of um, promote WebAssembly on their um, on the official WebAssembly page. It's like it's so much to take in this. So first time when I started like learning about WebAssembly, I was like, oh, there's this thing. This is like about two years ago when I saw the talk by Link Like. So I went to their website. It's actually much better now. Like it's it's well designed now. Back then it looked a little bit like first page of Uber. It was horrendous. And um, so yeah, basically like it's WebAssembly is, is presented as a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. It is designed as a portable target for compilation of high-level languages like C and C++. So imagine like imagine you're completely new to this, and this is the first piece of information you get. You're like, oh shit! You just close the web and just like, go for a pint. Um, but let's let's try to unpack it. So. What is a virtual machine? So when we talk about virtual machines in in um, in, in WebAssembly, we mean we don't have in mind the sort of virtual machine which emulates operating system. What we have in mind is something like like Java, something which emulates a process and places your code into a safe sandbox and sort of like expose the operating system APIs through via, via some sort of like safe uh, um, sandbox. Um, stack based, basically. Uh, okay, let's not go. Let's, let's not let's not let's not look after that. Uh, but, but does anybody know what the stack is? Stack is basically a data structure uh, where you just place one thing on top of each other, and when you need to do something, you just grab it, you just pop it. So WebAssembly WebAssembly is literally almost like an assembly language, but slightly more readable than ASM. And and the way it's executed, you sort of like. Chuck a lot of stuff on top of each other on the stack, and then once you run, once you once you want to run some kind of operation, you just like pop it and and you and you run it. So um, my God, that's a mouthful. So if we look closer, what it looks like. So <laughs> this is again a courtesy of uh, Lenny. Um, what WebAssembly allows us to do right now, you can you can you can program some application in a, in a statically compiled language, and Turn it into like intermediate representation, which then can be turned and optimized for machine code, which can then be executed on a machine. So, um, let's say let's say you let's say you want to write a very graphics ex extensive like sort of application when running on web. So this is what WebAssembly is actually really really well suited for because all these game all these old games. And all these apps are all written on C++, C and C++, and basically, if you want to run C or C++ on the web, you're basically out of options and because you can only run JavaScript. Um, so what, what, what used to be the case in the past is a lot of people uh, using other programming languages other than JavaScript, they used to transpile their code, and what, what that is basically, they auto-generate big piles of JavaScript, which is then completely unoptimized and it just it just makes things much worse and then you spend a lot of time optimizing the auto-generated code and you know how much fun that is. Um, so 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 WebAssembly you know, like in a like in a sort of like uh, compiler sort of tuition looks sort of like this. So you have, let's say you have a language like C or C you, you throw it you throw it into like LLVM, which is the probably the most well known um, compiler toolchain. And it produces intermediate representation, which is which is something not very readable to humans. But there is an LLVM backend which can take it and turn it into um, optimized machine code, which, which can then run on the machine. And then that code is then interpreted by uh, by a sandbox. So this this is incredibly powerful if you think about it, because because JavaScript on its own, like we saw that massively long Moodle is is really slowing things down, and we're really finding. We're finding it really hard to like, sort of make the Moodle shorter. If, if anything, we're making it actually much longer. So, besides all of that, we're, we're opening a lot of opportunities, as I said, like to many other languages and like many other like old tools which could never, you know, previously run properly on the web. So, I'll show you something. So, does anybody has anybody ever used like Autodesk? 
all those. Oh, awesome. So they, if you remember the Autodesk, is like a, this massively you know, loaded uh, desktop app, which takes like a couple of minutes to run. Turns out Autodesk was like, OK, why don't we just like try to compile these like 30 years old C++ code base and chuck it on the web using WebAssembly? Turns out they did it. So now they're offering, now they're offering um, AutoCAD on a web, which is really cool. Um, Google, Google are now uh, basically porting Google Earth to Wasm. So you're going to be able to run Google Earth, like it's going to turn into from this like sluggish thing, which is like killing your CPU on your laptop into this like really, really awesome smooth experience. And these are the, these are the kind of things which WebAssembly um, are making American basically like available to, to developers. eBay, for example, most recently uh, used WebAssembly for um, for uh, their barcode verification thing and improve the performance of, of their site by 50%. Um, the key is, turns out, turns out the three strongly typed languages are actually pretty fast and we can finally run them on the web. But wait, it gets much better. So as soon as you, WebAssembly on its own, it's like, it's, it's a classic epitome of how hard is it to name things uh, in computer science. Because somebody, Create something and then picks up a name, which is sort of like sometimes a very like you know, reasonable people name things in a way which sort of communicate those things are useful. Um, so WebAssembly originally was was created to make the web faster. Turns out people started using or like compiling things into WebAssembly and using them on things like operating systems. So to run to run other applications, there is a hacker in um, in Japan who literally um, Compiled Wing into WebAssembly. So imagine that. It's like, ooh, I'm trying to figure out what WebAssembly is, and there is a guy in Japan who is running his Wing as a WebAssembly binary. Um, so there is, yeah, there is, there is a lot, there is a lot of things happening right now. There's a lot of video innovation happening, and because of that, because of people started starting to use the WebAssembly outside of the web browser, um, Mozilla started facing like really interesting questions, like, okay, maybe we've just created something way bigger than we thought originally. So they, um, in order to accommodate the other use cases than web browser, they, um, they created this called called BASI, which is WebAssembly System Interface. And this is sort of like, this is sort of, this is, this is sort of like a POSIX, a POSIX layer for WebAssembly, but not like in a shit way, uh, like the other <laughs> So, so with BASI, uh, with BASI, so BASI is a, is a system interface, it's an open specification, which allows you, which basically defines an operation, which allows you, which will allow you uh, to run your Wasm, Wasm binary uh, pretty much anywhere, pretty much anywhere where Wasm is going to be supported, which is really amazing. Now we'll, we'll be able we'll be able to run uh, Wasm binaries on IoT devices. Whoa, lots of security issues. Can't wait for that. Um, <laughs> saying that, if you, if you read if you read the specification or if you watch one of the Lin's talks, she she explains uh, what Wasm is about. It it takes a different approach to security. Um, the, um, it's designed using capability based securities. Which is way way more secure um, than uh, what we're doing right now, like ACLs um, and all these like madness, which is just creating more problems than um, than it's solving. Um, so with Wasi, we created something like Java, but better. <laughs> something like Java, but better because Java, JVM is incredibly heavyweight. Um, plus, we got rid of Larry Ellis and Oracle. How cool is that? Um, and uh, everything is just so much faster. Um, with WASI uh, being an open specification, uh, you can basically, if you implement, uh, if you basically follow the specification, you can run your own run, you can build your own runtime environment, which is sort of like saying, hey, I want to build a new JVM. I mean, you can do it, but with all that like craft and which piled up over the years, I mean, who wants to do that, right? So with WASI, you basically we're start basically like trying like starting from scratch. There's a lot of learning lessons. And uh, people are actually now trying to implement their own um, uh, their own runtime environments. So, for example, um, uh, if you've ever heard of a company called Fastly or Cloudflare, so Fastly have created their own runtime environment called Lucid. And the, and the best thing about the best thing about uh, uh, WebAssembly is it's very compact, which makes things much faster. And uh, because the uh, the uh, instruction set is actually very small. It's very small, it's more secure. It basically, if you go into details, it allows you only to um, sort of like allocate the linear side of memory, which means like, oh, no more stack overflow errors. Imagine that. 
Imagine we knew that when we created C. Um, so, so, so there's lots of, there's lots of things happening. Um, what, what this means is like small instruction set and open specification is we can run code much faster, much faster to the point that, for example, Lucid, which is the name of the Fastly uh, runtime they recently released, they can they can spin the code. So the reason why they built it is because they want to run. Uh, code on the edge servers because Fastly as a company is a CDN network. It's basically if you, if you know what the content delivery networks are There used to be there used to be like these like dumb uh, media stores where you just go there and fetch the app because the data is closer to you and Therefore, you know, you can fetch you can you can fetch the data much faster and everything like this <laughs> illusion like wow Web is really fast. What they realize like with WebAssembly, WebAssembly gives them an opportunity to run code faster on the edge so with this, you can basically build a small WebAssembly binary, throw it to them, and they'll run it for you on the edge. So you sort of like turn the CDN into like more uh, dynamic and intelligent environment. What is really cool though about it is with WASI, and, and WebAssembly being like very, very compact and small, uh, they, can, they can speed up your app within like microseconds, which is like, think about it, it's like J JVM, how much, how much time does it take JVM to pick up all the bytecode and just finally like, get it running. It's completely insane. If it, yeah, if it, if it ever even starts. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, uh, just getting a couple of hours until I tune JVM, like, what is the stack size member of this? Oh my God. Um, so so they, they, they achieve all these like crazy benchmarks. Um, and Clover are doing actually very, something very similar. If you ever heard about Clover workers, um, it's also running, you can also like compile a bit, um, WebAssembly binary, which is like throw it on that and we'll run it for you. Um, so, coming back to the original point, it's like WebAssembly as such is a compilation target. So, what it is, is you have a piece of code, you run it through a WebAssembly compiler, and it basically produces a bytecode, which is sort of like a binary instruction set, which you can then throw on whatever can be called a bytecode and run your code. So we'll, we'll basically just coming back to the point of like, oh, instead of like all these like interpreting languages, we'll, we'll, end up, we'll end up basically using these binaries, decoding them and executing them. And that's really good because, because a, lot of these, a lot of these interpreting languages and a lot of the JavaScript code and all this stuff is, is, is very slow and basically we can now optimize some of the like really hot parts in our, in our applications. Uh, let's, say, let's, say, let's say you know that they, um, your Python app is very slow in some kind of path, and you know there is a global interpreter log, so, well, slim pickings, you're screwed. So you can write a piece of code in Rust, compile it into web, WebAssembly, throw it on the server, and then your Python application just loads it, and it loads it really fast because it's very small, compact, and it's basically binary. It decodes it and executes it. So, um, yeah, it's, it all sounds like very simple, but right now it's incredibly cutting edge. So. So you will, uh, if you use WebAssembly right now, and and, um, and you're not like you know very well versed in like in its inner workings, you will probably end up like cutting yourself in your in your fingers. Um, there's also because of because of it being uh, bleeding edge technology, there's lots of security issues which need to be addressed. Because when you when you compile a binary, when you when you compile a code into a binary, which you then throw onto web, and your web page basically loads it, decodes it, and executes it. You, you basically manage to hide a lot of internal code. And that's really, really interesting. And one of the interesting, interesting use cases were some Chinese hackers um, who basically started throwing WASM binaries onto some websites, which allowed them to run them. Turns out those WASM binaries were mining bitcoins. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of interesting opportunities which need to be, I mean, which opportunities and also challenges which need to be addressed before, uh, before this is this is basically uh, going to be ready for sort of like prime time, prime time for production. So I said at the beginning of the talk, I'm going to speculate a little bit about. So I wrote a little a little blog post about. If you go to my blog, I wrote a little blog post about about WebAssembly and where I see it's going uh, with regards to the future. And uh, I personally think, like in a, in a few years' time, it's going to be everywhere. We're going to be running WebAssembly almost everywhere. So there is even like somebody asked me for the meetup if if, if we can run uh, WebAssembly on our phones. Not right now, but there is a swift, swift WebAssembly compilation target that can be worked on at the moment. So uh, in the future, 
what's going to probably happen, in my opinion, is like you, you're probably going to end up downloading a lot of some small binaries, uh, which are going to be like decoded right on your phone and executed. There is a there is someone there is a, there is someone who um, in US who built this thing, which which basically um, he he built a plugin for Postgres, which downloads a binary uh, from S3, which is a Wasm binary. He unpacks it and then trigger. So basically, his his SQL triggers are executing uh, Wasm binaries. So there's going to be lots of lots of these things happening more and more. And with Buzzy, we're going to end up running WebAssembly pretty much everywhere. So what does that mean for, for DevOps? So there's a couple of things. Probably um, you will uh, finally go to the point where, why I'm here actually? I don't know myself. Um, so, so what does that mean? So well, this is again speculation. Wasn't being a compilation target, it means in the future, I'm imagining we'll probably end up like building a lot of <coughs> small batteries which will end up being distributed via edge servers of CDNs. And they're going to make the code much closer to the clients. They're going to make the code much closer to the clients, and they're going to be really compact. So you're going to be able to like, you're going to, you're going to be able to run a lot of functions right on your phone, much closer. You don't have to go through like multiple layers of turtles until you finally reach that server who will run something for you. The server will basically just like beat the edge server. That's going to be your execution thing. So I, 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 I think this, this, this is personally my future. So what's going to happen is like people will still build the, build, build the binaries. They will need to figure out a way how to check the integrity of the binaries uh, so that your phone can verify the integrity of the data, origins, and things like that. Security is a huge, huge thing and a huge, huge topic. Um, it's going to be completely redefined in, in many ways. So, um, so yeah, there's nothing to be worried about that much. <laughs> um, how, how you can study? I would, I would probably like recommend to you uh, to watch all Lynn Clark's talks about Wasm. She's she's a brilliant speaker. She's she's an amazing engineer. She's even better speaker. Uh, probably not, but it's the other way around. Um, there's a there's a company called Wasmer who are building a lot of WebAssembly tools, and they give you this like Docker experience where you just you can just do Wasm Wasmer run this, and it basically can run. WebAssembly in Python, in Ruby, what have you. They even like I think recently introduced some kind of like uh, WebAssembly package managers and all kinds of random things. Uh, you can also play with Wasm in Terrarium, which is uh, developed by Fastly, which is the CDN company I talked about. Uh, it's basically like an interactive sort of playground where you can write code. I think right now only do you can only write code in C or Rust. So if you don't know any of those languages, sorry about that. Um, but it allows you basically to see um, what's going on with Wasm, how it's compiled, and like sort of like interactive environment. Um, and also, like you can go to uh, to my GitHub. When I was learning about WebAssembly, there's a bunch of examples which I built. Some of them are in C, some of, some of them are in C++. There's a lot of horrendous JavaScript which I wrote um, to learn about it. I mean, I'm not a JavaScript developer. Sometimes I'm forced to write on some. Um, so you can you can go ahead. What is really cool about I forgot to say about WebAssembly. So I was talking about like how WebAssembly is this like instruction set which can get executed by some runtime, and it's much faster. What what you can do is the WebAssembly binary. It is literally binary. But what Mozilla did was like, okay, we're gonna throw this technology to web developers, and they're all used to you know inspect the code in a in a web console. So like, how are we gonna address them? So they wrote like a bunch of tools which allow you to dump the binary into human readable um, sort of uh, text, and it looks like Lisp. All the rows leads to Lisp and S expressions. We're closing the loop. Finally, it happened. Um, so you can you can you can use that, and you can like look inside. Um, there's a lot of that stuff actually on my repo. You can you can go and check it out. Play. I'm, to be honest, I'm not I'm not getting any warranties that still works. This is like a year and a half long. Um, and yes, so I want to like finish this with this with this uh, TV show I started watching a couple months ago, and it's and it's really cool um, because I believe I believe Wasm with Wasm we're definitely like on the cusp of something really really huge. It's just super super early right now. Nobody can imagine the future. I started watching this TV show, and I just when I started writing like the slides for the for this thing, and I just remember like okay, remember this scene from a show called Hold and Catch Fire. There is there is this hacker, and she she comes up with a way of 
this, this show is, is basically based in the 1980s, which is the golden era of like creating computers. The people are just like building, you know, assembling computers from like, you know, tiny electronic components. I just like, how do I make this like pile of hardware to like, how do I make it so that people love it? So she comes. She, so she comes up with this idea of like you know personalized computing, and you have this like assistant and kind of stuff. She goes. She goes to this like group of hardware hackers, and she tells them about this. I was like, oh, I need, I need 38 kilobytes more of RAM. And everybody was like, 38? You're completely crazy. We can't give you 38 kilogram, uh, kilobytes. I was like, 38 kilobytes? Come on. And um, and then they ended up having like this crazy argument. And this is her boss, and and, and um, he's like, well, you need to be very careful because. You know, they wanted to shoot the bet on this. And the reason for that is because you're the future and they're still the past. So with that, let's go to the future with Rosalind. Thank you. Any questions? Or should we just go to the path and have a lot of questions and the answers there? You can ask a question, but there's a question. There's a question. There's a question. There's a if the Holy Grail is to learn how to compile your JavaScript, it's one of No. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, so WebAssembly is, is a binary form. So you will you will not be writing as much JavaScript as you used to. Because you will write big well, the big chunks of the web code. Is or like a you know web application code will end up being written in strongly typed languages, mm -hmm. which is going to be memory efficient, and you're going to get all these like performance boosts, which would never which we would never squeeze out of, out of JavaScript. What your JavaScript is going to be doing is is going to be decoding it from the from the thing and then executing it. So basically, uh, you, how, how how many of these how many of you guys here use npm? NPM. So what sometimes what you need to do is like when you in install the app, like uh, install some NPM package, you have to compile the native extensions, right? That's kind of crazy sometimes, right? So what you will end up doing with Wasm, those native extensions are going to be compiled already in Wasm. With Wasm, with Wasm, which will give you that universal sort of like system <coughs> interface, everything will become a native extension by default. So you will end up like your net NPM is going to pull down. Uh, wasm binary, your JavaScript is going to load it, unpack it, execute. Does it answer your question? Awesome. Yeah. 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 You mentioned um, some companies have done some stuff with this. Is, is there any support for it um, out in browsers? Maybe? Exactly. That's a great question. Yes, all the major browsers support WebAssembly right now. Uh, the most cutting edge is Mozilla, obviously, being the authors of WebAssembly. So if you get Mozilla Nightly, you will get all the cutting edge um, support of like the, the cutting edge WebAssembly features. But all the major browsers already support it. So that node, you might, if you if you go to that thing I have there, that should still run in every major browser. So all with, they're all up there. They're like, yeah. It's essentially I think we're we're entering like the new uh, sort of G era <coughs> where where um, you know in the past we would have all these like. JIT compilers, every browser would be sort of competing on like whose JavaScript JIT would be faster. In fact, there is a Wasm, Wasm JIT by Mozilla, which does basically that as well. What they do is they do streaming compilation, so you can actually like, you know, stream the Wasm and it will compile it on the fly and execute it sometime. But I think it's, um, I'm not sure what the state is. Is the community coming around like a package manager for Wasm? Yeah, so these guys, these guys, uh, Wasmer guys, Wasmer.io. So everything they do, they're a commercial entity, but like yeah. you know, open source commercial entity, whatever that means. Uh, they actually have a uh, Wasm package manager. So Wasmer, Wasmer is, is a company, but also it's the name of the CLI tool, which allows you to package your stuff and also allows you to run it. And it's, yeah, it's just. And one other question, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned a few examples of where it's been used out, like in the wild in production. I kind of imagine like all the graphics tools that have come out, like Framer and Figma, probably are using this somewhere. But I don't know if there's any other more like high-profile examples of where. So the it's most high-profile, the most high-profile right now is Google Earth. Okay. Google Earth are literally like 
They, you can, if you go to Google Earth slash beta equals one, mm -hmm. that's the most high profile I can think of. And then the AutoCAD, and there is a bunch of other companies, like you, you're absolutely right. This is a perfect fit for kind of stuff, for, the, for this kind of stuff. Do you know if they're already using it? Like, so the AutoCAD, the, the AutoCAD company. No, 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 sorry, like Framer and Figma and like the web design. Oh, I'm not sure to be honest, yeah. I don't know. Because they put like Photoshop in the browser and that kind of seems like, Yes, yeah, yeah. they are working on that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, they are working on that, but I'm not sure if that's already okay, running. Cool. But how cool is that gonna yeah, be? Yeah, it's really cool. I hope one day Hangouts will not kill our secrets. <laughs> Google food. You know what they say, like when you have a spear and you wish for something. <laughs> then you get buzzing. Google food sports is fine. Luckily, Google are actually actively involved with buzzing as well, so. <laughs> but yeah, if they kill it before, it yeah, happens to Anything else? Okay, Milos, always informative, very entertaining. Thank you very, very much.